Secret Seven by Enid Blyton. Were you having a meeting of the Secret Seven again? asked Peter's mother. I don't know. Why, mother? asked Peter, looking up from his book. Well, because if you do, I don't think you ought to meet in that old shed of yours, said his mother. It's such very cold weather. You'd better meet up here in the house. Oh, no, mother, said Janet, joining in. It wouldn't be a secret meeting, then. We must meet in the shed. Well, you'll have to heat it up a little, then, said mother. I can't have you down with colds just at the end of the Christmas term. Can't you do without meetings till after Christmas? Not very well, said Janet. We'd half thought it would be a good idea to take the Christmas presents we're making down to the shed. All seven of us, I mean, and have a sort of making presents meeting. We thought we could all wear our coats. You'd be frozen, said Mother. I'll lend you my new little safety first stove. Even if it's knocked over, it's safe. Then I shan't be afraid of the shed catching fire. Oh, thank you, Mother, said both children together. And Scamper, the golden spaniel, barked loudly. Woof, woof as if he thoroughly agreed. Janet and Peter looked at one another. What with exams and one thing or another, we haven't really had much time for the Secret Seven, said Peter. It would be nice and cosy in the shed with that stove. We could take all the Christmas things we're making and do them down there. We'll tell the others tomorrow, said Janet. We shall have to have a new password. It's so long since we had a meeting. What shall we have? Custard pudding, said Peter, grinning. What an idiotic password, said Janet. Why not ham and eggs, or toad in the hole, or... Toad in the hole? That's rather a good one, said Peter. It'll make the others laugh. All right, said Peter. Toad in the hole. <laughs> Nobody will forget that. Let's see. That's sausage and batter pudding, isn't it? Of course it is, said Janet. How can you forget that? Seeing that last time we had it... You wet four toads, four sausages, and felt jolly queer afterwards. So I did, said Peter. Scamper, the password is toad in the hole. Don't forget. Woof, said Scamper, and wagged his tail. Next day at school, Peter called Colin, Jack, and George into a corner. Secret seven meeting on Saturday at ten o'clock in the shed, he said. The password is toad in the hole. You know, sausages in batter. What a password, said Jack. I'll never remember such a silly one. I'll have to write it down. No, don't. That awful sister, Susie of yours, might find your notebook and see the password, said Peter. All right. I'll make up a rhyme about it. That'll help me to remember it, said Jack. Let's see. Old King Cole was a jolly old soul. His favourite dinner was toad in the hole. <laughs> I'll remember it all right now. You heard the time of the meeting, didn't you? said Peter. You looked a bit scatty this morning. Well, I feel it, said Jack. What with exams and things, and preparing for old Boney. He's coming to stay with me, you know, and... Old Boney? Who on earth is he? A skeleton or something? asked Peter. Ass? He's a French boy. The one I went to stay with in France last year, said Jack. His name is Jean Bonaparte. No relation of the great general. He's, well, he's awfully serious and earnest, and I can't say I'm much looking forward to his coming. I'm hoping Susie will take him off my hands. She rather fancies herself with foreigners. Oh, don't you tell Susie anything about the meeting on Saturday, said Peter. You pack her off somewhere with Boney. I suppose he wouldn't let me take him to the meeting, asked Jack. I mean, Mother's sure to say I can't leave him alone on Saturday. He's coming on Friday, you see. And it will look a bit rude to rush off by yourself the very next morning. You don't seem very keen on coming to a Secret Seven meeting, said Peter. Don't be an ass. Of course I want to come. But my mother isn't like yours. She doesn't think the Secret Seven is at all important. But I will come if I possibly can, said Jack. All right. But don't you let Susie know. And don't tell her the password, said Peter. I hope you've not forgotten how she and Binky, that awful giggling friend of hers, once got into our shed before a meeting and locked the door on the inside so that we couldn't get in and asked us for the password. Jack gave a sudden grin. Yes, <laughs> it was awful of them. I'll come somehow, even if I have to park Boney in an ice cream shop and buy him half a dozen ices to keep him quiet. By the way, tell me the password again, Peter. But Peter had gone. Blow, 
What was that password now? Old King Cole? Sausages? Dinner time? Jack went off frowning. What with his sister Susie and exams and Christmas looming up and that ass of a bony, life was very, very difficult. When Saturday morning came, Peter and Janet were very busy. They carried the safety first stove down to the shed and Gardner came in to light it for them. He looked round the shed. Hmm. You've had it get pretty messy, haven't you? He said. Waste of a good shed, this. That's what I think. It isn't wasted, said Peter. We use it for our meetings. You know we do. Gardner gave one of his grunts and walked out. I say, doesn't that stove make the shed nice and warm, said Peter. Back up and tidy round, Janet. I'll put out the boxes to sit on. Did you remember your badge? Oh, yes. <laughs> You're wearing it. I hope the others will all remember theirs. Woof, woof, said Scamper. Almost ten o'clock, said Peter, looking at his watch. Now, are the others going to be late? They sat down on the boxes to wait for them. The door, with its big SS on it, was fast shut. Footsteps came up to it at last, and someone knocked loudly. Peter, what's the password? whispered Janet suddenly. Was it... was it sausages? Be quiet, said Peter, and then yelled out loudly, Password, please. Jack's voice answered. Peter, I've forgotten it. I just know it had something to do with dinner. Is it roast beef? No. Well, is it fried bacon and eggs? No. Go home if you can't remember it. Janet nudged Peter. I forgot it too, you know. Let him in. Against the rules, said Peter sternly. Well, is it old King Cole? asked Jack. No, it is not, said Peter. Then more footsteps were heard, and Peter called out again. Password, please. Toad in the hole, came the answer in a girl's voice. Peter swung open the door, and in stepped Susie, Jack's sister, with a very skinny-looking boy behind her. Susie, get out! You don't belong to the Secret Seven. How did you know the password? shouted Peter, very angry indeed. I heard Jack saying it to himself two days ago, said Susie, smiling wickedly, and... Jack? You gave our password away, cried Peter. At that moment, all the others came up in a bunch and stood amazed at the sight of a furious Peter at the door of the shed, a white-faced Jack, a grinning Susie, and a skinny boy they didn't know. What's up, said George, and who's this? He looked at Boney, who gazed back at him owlishly through big glasses. My name is Jean-Baptiste Bonaparte, said the French boy, and bowed most politely. I stay with my good friend, Jacques. His good sister, she bring me here. There was a short silence. Then Colin spoke up. Look, I don't really know what's going on, but for goodness sake, ask us into the shed, Peter. It's freezing out here. Everyone surged into the shed without waiting for an invitation. That was too much for Peter. Look here, this is supposed to be a secret meeting, he shouted. Susie, get out and take Boney or Skinny or whatever his name is with you. You don't belong to the Secret Seven. My mother will be most annoyed about this, said Susie, her nose well up in the air. When Jack told her he couldn't play with Boney because you had said he must come to the meeting, Mother said, all right, he could go, but he must take Boney too. He wouldn't take him, so I've brought him. Well, you just take him away again, said Peter. Do you hear? Take him away, and you can go too, Jack. No, said Janet. You ought to stay, Jack. You're a Secret Seven member. Stay! The poor French boy hurriedly backed away down the path to the front gate, bowing most politely all the time. Susie went with him. I'd better go with them, said poor Jack. But Peter pulled him into the shed and banged the door. How dare you let Susie know the password? How dare you let anyone know we're a meeting here today? And why aren't you wearing your badge? You don't deserve to be a member of the Secret Seven. And fancy bringing that awful boy here, cried Peter. I didn't bring him here. Susie did, said Jack. And how was I to know she was listening at the door of my bedroom when I was trying to learn the password? And I haven't forgotten my badge. I didn't wear it in case Susie saw it and followed me. Look, I've got it here in my pocket. And don't you glare at me like that. I'll glare at you all I like said Peter. I tell you, you don't deserve to be... All right, all right. You've said that already, said Jack, glaring back. If I don't deserve to belong, I won't belong. 
I don't want it any more. I can't help having a sister like Susie, can I? Well, now you can be the secret six. Goodbye. He took his badge out of his pocket and threw it down at Peter's feet. Then he walked out of the door, his head high, ashamed of the sudden tears that came to his eyes. To leave the secret seven was the hardest thing Jack had ever done in his life. Nobody stirred. They were all too shocked by Jack's sudden and surprising outburst. Peter stared at the fallen badge, not knowing what to do or say. But Scamper knew what to do. He tore out of the door, barking as if to say, Come back, come back. He ran round Jack's feet and leapt up to lick him. But Jack pushed him away. No, get down. You're not my friends anymore. Scamper ran back to the shed with his tail well down. Peter, you aren't going to let Jack go, are you? You know it wasn't his fault. I'll ask Jack to come back, of course, but he shouldn't have lost his temper like that, said Peter. You lost yours, sobbed Barbara. This is the first time we've ever quarrelled. I don't like it. Uh, let's write a note to Jack, said Colin. Let's say we're sorry. Come on, Peter. You did go on at him, you know, and honestly, it's not his fault, and I know it's not his fault that his sister is such a nuisance, said Peter. All right. We'll write a note, and we can all sign it. Will that do? I'm sorry I lost my temper. I really am. But Susie's enough to make anyone see red. Peter sent Janet to the house to fetch some writing paper. He felt ashamed of himself. Soon Janet was back with writing paper and an envelope. Peter wrote a short and apologetic note, signed by everybody. He read it out to the others. Dear Jack, please don't let's make mountains out of molehills. I'm awfully sorry for what I said. You know we can't do without you. We can't possibly be the secret six. We're meeting again tomorrow evening at six. Please come. I'm enclosing your badge. We all want you back. From Peter, Janet, Pam, Barbara, Colin and George. Sounds all right, said George. I'll better be glad to get it. Who's going to take the note, said Janet. I'll take it, offered George. I go by his house. Well, be careful, Susie isn't lying in wait for you, said Peter, licking the envelope. Remember, everyone, meet here tomorrow evening at six o'clock. Remember now, toad in the hole. Right, said George, and took the note. Let's hope we'll be the secret seven again tomorrow. The next evening, which was Sunday, Janet and Peter went down to the shed again and set the shed in order. Then Janet put some little chocolate buns on a plate, a present from her mother. Mother doesn't know a thing about the quarrel, she said, and I hope no one ever tells her. She's rather surprised we're holding another meeting so soon, though. Bang, bang. That was someone at the door already. Yes, Pam and Barbara together. They whispered the password through the door. Toad in the hole. The door opened, and they went in, beaming. Oh, I hope Jack will be with you, he said. He's not here yet. Well, it's not quite six o'clock. He'll be along in a minute. Somehow... They all felt rather nervous of facing Jack. Ah, there he is, said Peter, as a patter of feet was heard at last. Toad in the hole, said a voice outside the door. Peter swung it open, beaming. But it wasn't Jack. It was Susie. Her voice and Jack's were very much alike. She stood there, stern-faced, and thrust a note at Peter. Here you are, she said. Read this. You deserve all it says. She pushed the note into Peter's hand and disappeared at once into the darkness. Read it out, said Colin. And Peter read it to the others. Dear Secret Six, thank you for your note and apology from Peter. Sorry, but there's nothing doing. I've finished with you. I'm forming a club with Susie, Binky, Boney and three others. We'll be the Secret Seven and you'll be the Secret Six. Jack. There was absolute silence. Nobody knew what to say. They sat staring at one another in such a peculiar silence that Scamper became scared. He crept over to Janet and put his nose into her hand. She broke the silence with a sudden sob. Oh, Scamper, do you feel miserable too, like us? Peter, Peter, Jack can't mean it, said George. What shall we do? Well, we can't have two Secret Seven clubs going, said George. We'd better be the Secret Six. What's it matter if we're seven or six? And the letters SS will do for the secret six badges just as well as for secret seven. Put it to the vote, said Colin. We've got to do something about it. 
or else break up the club altogether. We'll vote, said the girls. And the boys agreed. So very solemnly they voted and agreed that their club was now the Secret Six. Let's not go on with this meeting tonight, said Janet. It doesn't seem right without old Jack. Let's meet again some other time. Some other time? Nobody said anything about another meeting. Day after day went and the Secret Six did not meet at all. Peter's mother was surprised. Aren't the Secret Seven meeting again soon, she asked. I hope you haven't quarrelled. Oh, I expect we'll meet again after Christmas, Mother, said Peter, going very red. You see, well, we're all pretty busy now. Susie was busy too. She had told her friend Binky all that had happened and how Jack had left the Secret Seven. So we'll be the Secret Seven, she said. You and I and Jack, that's three, and Boney, his French friend, that's four, and we'll choose three others. Don't look so miserable, Jack. We'll back you up. You shall be the leader. At first, Jack agreed with everything they said. But when he found that the extra three were all to be girls, he shook his head. No, he said, I've changed my mind. I don't want to belong to any more clubs. The Secret Seven was a fine club, and there couldn't ever be a better one. Well said Susie in a fine range. Well, all right then. We jolly well won't have you in our club. You can just be on your own. Christmas came and went, with all its excitements and parties and pantomimes. Peter's mother came to him with a wonderful idea in the new year. Would you like me to give a party for the Secret Seven, she said. At first, Peter and Janet felt thrilled, and then they remembered that they were only six. How could they explain that to Mother? She would probably be very cross to think that Peter had been the cause of Jack leaving the Secret Seven. Well, let's ask her to put off the club party till after the Christmas holidays, said Janet. After all, we do have a lot of parties and things to go to. It snowed in the new year, and Peter and Janet and Scamper were delighted. Lovely, said Janet, looking out of the window at the great smooth layer of whiteness covering the farm fields. Lovely. We can go to bogganing soon. Janet was just about to turn away from the window when she saw someone coming up the path that led to the kitchen door. Hello, here's Matt the shepherd, she said. He looks pretty grim. I hope there's nothing wrong with Dad's sheep out on the snowy hills. Mother popped her head round the door. Matt the shepherd wants a word with your father, she said. Find him for me, will you? Janet raced upstairs. Dad, Dad, old Matt wants you. He's at the kitchen door. Now, what does he want? said her father. I only saw him yesterday. I'll be down in a minute, tell him. Janet ran downstairs to the kitchen door. Matt was looking very grim indeed. Janet's father came along then, and Matt touched his hat to him. What is it, Matt? asked Janet's father. Nothing wrong, I hope. Yes, master, there is somewhat very wrong, said Matt. You know my old friend, Shadow, my dog, my fine old collie that's won a mort of prizes? Well, he's gone, sir. Gone. Gone? What on earth do you mean? said Janet's father. Uh, not dead, surely. He wasn't more than five, was he? No, sir. He's been stolen. I'm sure of it, sir. Shadow would never go far from me, except when he was rounding up the sheep. I've whistled and called, but Shadow didn't come. Oh, I didn't know what to do, sir, so I came to you. I can't do without that dog of mine. He's like a brother to me, sir. Not just a dog. Janet's mother came to see what was the matter, and soon the whole family, and Matt as well, were sitting in the living room, discussing Shadow the Collie. Matt was quite certain that his dog was stolen. That dog of mine's worth a lot of money, he said. The prizes he wins. We could sell him for a hundred pounds, sir. But I wouldn't take a thousand for him. No, that I wouldn't. I never had a dog that was better company. Don't you worry, Matt said Janet's father. I'll get straight on to the police. You're quite certain he couldn't have wandered away and lost himself. What? A hill-born collie has kept my sheep for years, said Matt. Best collie dog I ever had, too. I'll not stay on these hills without him. I'd fret too much.
Right, Matt. You go back to your sheep, and I'll telephone the police right away, said Janet's father. Don't worry too much. Why, you may find old Shadow waiting up there for you. Well, sure, if I do, and dear knows I hope you're right, I stand at the top of the hill there and wave my old cloak, said Matt, and went slowly back to the kitchen door and away over the snow. Oh, mother, said Janet, will he get Shadow back again? I hope so, said her mother. But if it's a dog stealer at work, it may be very difficult. Mother, will Scamper be all right, said Peter, and a feeling of sudden dread went through him. Mother, Scamper is valuable, isn't he? A pedigree golden spaniel. Yes, yes he is, said his mother. But I don't think you need worry, dear. It will be very difficult to steal a dog living in a household. One who's under our eyes all the time. Shadow was always off and away over the hills for miles, you know. If anyone liked to tempt him with a bit of meat, he might take it and be captured. Here comes Pam, said Janet, looking out of the window. Gracious, she looks as miserable as old Matt. What can be the matter with her? Oh, I do hope she hasn't had bad news, too. They heard Pam's voice calling them. Janet, Peter, something dreadful's happened. Let me in, quickly. Peter raced to the front door and opened it. What's the matter, Pam? What's happened? Oh, Peter, you know my granny. You know her lovely poodle, the white one that always looks as if she'd had a coat of snow. Well, it's been stolen. And, oh, Peter, I thought perhaps we could have a meeting about it and see if the Secret Seven... I mean the Secret Six, can do anything to help. Granny's so upset. Goodness gracious, said Peter, pulling Pam indoors. We've only just heard that somebody has stolen our shepherd's dog, Shadow. He was very valuable too. It must be the same thief. Quick, come and tell my father. Pam went into the living room with Peter, still crying. Daddy, wait a minute. Don't telephone the police yet. Another dog's been stolen, said Peter, rushing up to his father. Pam, tell my father about Snowy. Pam sobbed out all she knew. My granny let him out last night, about nine o'clock, as she always does. And when she called him, he didn't come in. She called and whistled and then put on a coat to look for him. But all she saw was... <laughs> was what? said Peter impatiently, imagining all kinds of dreadful things. She saw footsteps in the snow in her garden, sniffed Sam. Great big footprints tramping all about, and Snowy's neat little footprints were there too. And in one place, the snow was all scuffed up as if Snowy had been dragged along. Oh, Peter, can the Secret Seven do anything? You mean the Secret Six, said Peter. Well, we'll certainly call a meeting about it, and about our shepherd's dog too. After all, we've solved quite a lot of mysteries, but we've never come up against a dog stealer before. Peter's father listened to all that Pam said, frowning. I'll tell the police about Snowy, as well as about Shadow, he said, and picked up the telephone receiver. In a few moments, he was on to the police station, giving all details to the police. Then they heard him say, What? Three more dogs stolen? Besides these two, did you say? Well, what are you going to do about it? A dog isn't just a dog, you know. It's a friend of the family. He put down the receiver and turned to the listening children. Three valuable dogs besides Shadow and Snowy have been stolen, he said. And in every case, there have been these footprints in the snow, large prints. The police think the fellow must be a tall, heavy fellow who knows a great deal about dogs, or who has someone behind him who knows, and who tells him where to go. Tears were in Janet's eyes. She was holding Scamper close to her, as if she were afraid he might be stolen at any minute. Oh, Daddy, can we lock Scamper up in your room? I know he'll be stolen too. He's so beautiful and good and so valuable. He's a pedigree dog, isn't he? Yes, and he's worth a lot of money, said her father. I think perhaps we'd better guard him carefully till the thief is caught. There's one thing. The thief will treat all the dogs well, because their value would go down if they were ill or thin and not worth selling. But, but Scamper would be miserable if someone took him away from us, said Peter. He'd go thin at once, I know he would, and I don't believe he'd eat a thing. What would happen to him then? Let's not worry about things before they happen, said his father. Look after Scamper well, and don't let him leave your side. Now, I'm expecting the police at any moment. I have to take them up to Matt's hut, so that they can find out if the footprints in the snow there are the same as the others they have found. We'll go with you, said Janet, and we'll take Scamper. He ought to be all right, with three people to look after him. Yes, you go, said her mother. The walk will do you good. Scamper, walkies, walkies. 
Woof, said Scamper in delight, and flew to the door. Wait, wait for us, shouted Peter, afraid that Scamper would rush out and be stolen at once. Look, mother, there's someone out in the yard. He might be the thief. Don't be silly, dear. That's only the postman, said his mother. Go and see if he has a parcel for me. I'm expecting one. Peter went to the door in answer to the postman's double knock. Hello, postman, he said. Ah, you have a parcel for my mother. Do I sign for it? Yes, please, said the postman, and bent down to pat Scamper. He was a little man with a round, smiling face, and Peter and Janet liked him very much. As for Scamper, he adored him and frisked round him, barking in delight. You want to be careful of this lovely dog of yours, said the postman, patting Scamper. There's a dog stealer about, you know. Oh, Mrs. Tom's lovely dog has been taken. And Mr. Cartwright's Dachshund. Ah, he was a beauty, he was, with a coat like silk. And Miss Downey told me this morning her little Scotty was taken last week. Priceless he was. Worth goodness knows how much money. You be careful of this here spaniel of yours. Peter, Janet, Pam and Scamper sat down near the fire. Pam began to cry again as she spoke about Snowy, the pool that had belonged to her granny. Peter, don't you think we could call a meeting of the seven? I mean the six, she said. I do want to get Snowy back. Please, please do call a meeting. All right, said Peter, I will. I'll tell the others. I'll send them a note each. You and Pam can write one each, and I'll do the other. What about tomorrow morning? So the three sat down at the table and wrote out neat little notes. One to Barbara, one to George, and one to Colin. Important. Please meet in the SS shed tomorrow morning at half past ten, sharp. Seems funny not to send one to Jack, said Pam, as she licked her envelope. I suppose we couldn't possibly ask him to come. No, said Peter. He's probably got another club by now and called it the Secret Seven. Well, I don't believe he has, said Pam. I met him out the other day and he looked pretty miserable. He had that funny skinny boy with him. What's his name now? Bonaparte. Boney's a jolly good name for him. He was talking at top speed, waving his arms about like anything, and old Jack wasn't saying a single word. Don't let's talk about Jack, said Peter. Now, who's going to take these notes? I will on my way home, said Pam, getting up from the table. And for goodness sake, Peter, watch over your dear old scamper. What the Secret Seven, I mean the Secret Six, would do without him, I really don't know. Scamper would never, never go with a stranger, said Peter. Would you, Scamper? Woof, 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 said Scamper. He said, certainly not, said Peter. And Pam looked at Scamper admiringly. See you tomorrow at half past ten. Oh, same password as before. All right, see you tomorrow, Pam, said Peter. Peter and Janet spent the rest of the day watching Scamper. If he went out of the sitting room into the kitchen to beg a tidbit from Cookie, they went too. If he went for a little run, he was put on the lead at once. If he ran into the hall when someone came to the door, they went with him. He was rather surprised, but very pleased. You know, Janet, I think one of the things we ought to discuss at the meeting is the report saying that the same kind of footprints are found each time the dogs were stolen, said Peter. I wish we could get a picture of the footprints so that we could see the size and shape. You never know if we might come across them somewhere and be able to follow that thief. Oh, yes, said Janet. But, Peter, won't the police be doing that? Yes, but there's no reason why we shouldn't help them in tracking, is there? said Peter. Listen, who's that at the front door? A policeman, said Janet. I expect he's come about Matt's collie. Dad said he'd take him up to Matt's hut. Don't you remember? Oh, yes, of course, said Peter. Let's ask Daddy we can go with him. We might take a pencil and paper and copy any footprints we find. Oh, yes, said Janet. I'll get some paper at once and a measuring tape. Peter, ask Daddy we can go with him. Yes, said the children's father. You can come. And two minutes later, Peter, their father, and Cobbett the policeman all trailed up a long hill to where Matt the shepherd lived in his little hut. Scamper raced with them very happy. But Matt wasn't there. He's out with the sheep, looking for two or three missing ones, I expect, said Peter's father. Now he's lost his sheep dog, he's no one to help him. No, sir. Where did Matt say the dog disappeared? said Cobbett. He didn't say, said Peter. He just said he'd been stolen. I say, look, footprints, big ones too. 
but his father and the policeman had gone on, looking for Matt, and took no notice of Peter's excited voice. Where's that paper you brought, Janet? said Peter, thrilled. We'll copy these prints and show them to Dad when he comes back. They might be a very fine clue. The footprints were large and clear. I'll measure the prints, said Janet, feeling most important. She took out the tape measure she had brought and did a little measuring. She called the figures out to Peter and he wrote them down. He sat down in the snow just beside the footprints and painstakingly copied a print of a left foot and a print of a right foot. They really were very big. Trolley good, said Janet admiringly. Look, here come the others again. Let's show your drawings to them. Matt came slowly back with the children's father and the policeman. He looked old and sad. Look, Peter said, we found some footprints and we copied them. We thought they must have been made by the thief when he stood waiting to catch Shadow. The policeman took the paper, looked hard at the drawings, and then he looked at Peter. I'm sorry, lad, he said. These aren't the thief's footprints. Well, whose are they then, said Peter, surprised. They belong to old Matt here, said the policeman, with a little grin. Take a look at Matt's prints here now in the snow, just where he's been walking. He's wearing huge old snowshoes, bigger even than the prints you've drawn. Sure enough, the prints Peter had drawn had been made by old Matt. Oh, yes, I stand behind the hut there when I want to count my sheep down in the valley, he said. Them's my prints, all right. See, there's even the place shown here where the cobbler mended the sole with a patch. All right, Matt, old friend, said Peter's father seeing that the old man was trembling. We'll get Shadow back, don't you worry. Now come along, you two. It's probably going to snow again. Matt, you come along for a hot drink at tea time, and we'll give you some in a flask. Aye, sir, thank you, said Matt, and turned away, his eyes roving the snowy hills, always on the watch for his beloved Shadow. Dad, how would a dog thief entice old Shadow away? asked Peter. He's very fierce, you know, if anyone goes near his sheep. I've seen him show all his teeth and growl in a most terrifying way if a tramp walks by. He probably wasn't enticed, said his father. It would be easy enough to throw down a piece of meat and leave it for Shadow to find and eat. Meat with some kind of drug inside, perhaps, that would send a dog to sleep. Oh, how horrible, said Janet. You mean that the thief would come back and pick up the sleeping dog and take him away in a car or something? Yes, that's exactly what I do mean, said her father. I asked old Matt if he'd seen any strangers around, but he hadn't. He says nobody comes up to his hut except his friends. Old Burton the hedger, for instance, who trims the hedges round the field. And sometimes Gardner goes up to him with vegetables, and his brother goes to see him. And the grocer's boy takes him goods once a week, and occasionally the postman calls. All people who are his friends, and whom he knows well. Come along now, said her father impatiently. I want to get back. You keep your eyes open and see if the Secret Seven can use their brains and track down this thief. Why not have a meeting about it? That's just what we've planned, said Peter, bounding along over the snow. Tomorrow morning, Dad. Janet had to go to the town next morning to do some shopping for her mother. I'll go straight away now, Mother, she said. We have a meeting this morning, you know, about the dog stealing that's going on. Now look, here's the list, dear. If you hurry, you'll be back in good time for your meeting. Are you going to take Scamper with you? said her mother. Only if he's on the lead, said Janet. You see, that dog thief might be hiding somewhere, mother, watching for really good dogs. Well, I hardly think he would steal Scamper in the middle of a busy shopping morning, said her mother. He won't like being on the lead. Anyway, he never goes to a stranger. All the same, Janet put the surprise Scamper on the lead and walked off with him. When she came by the police station, she saw several people reading a notice on the board outside. She went up to see what it said. It was a list of dogs that disappeared during the last few days. Lost, stolen or strayed, it began, and then came the names and addresses of nine dogs. Nine, said Janet. Two from the next village and seven from ours. Scamper, keep to heel. She turned as someone called her name. Hello, Janet. I see Scamper isn't stolen yet. It was Susie, Jack's sister. She was walking along with Binky, her friend, and Boney, the French boy. Jack was not with them. Hello, said Janet, who didn't like Susie. How are the secret six? inquired Susie. All well and happy, I hope. I don't want to talk to you, said Janet. Scamper, come to heel. But Scamper was straining at his lead, 
trying his hardest to lick the French boy's legs. Boney patted him, and Scamper jumped up at him and licked his face. Scamper, said Janet in amazement. You've only seen Boney once, and that was for just a little while. Why are you making such a fuss of him? Oh, dogs adore Boney, said Susie, and Binky nodded her head. They go mad over him, even if they've never seen him before. Ça, c'est vrai, mon petit, n'est-ce pas? She added in French, turning to the French boy. He nodded. Oh, don't show off your wonderful French in front of me, said Janet. Scamper, stop it, you're being soppy. Soppy, soppy, what is soppy? Asked the French boy, fondling Scamper's silky ears. He is a chien très beau, how do you say? Boney says he's a very beautiful dog, translated Susie, for Janet's benefit. Thanks. I understand that much French, said Janet. Will you stop pulling, Scamper? Two more dogs came bounding up just then and stopped at once when they came to Boney. In a moment they were rubbing lovingly against him, pawing him, licking him. There you are, said Susie proudly. See how they love him. It's always the same. Any dog adores dear Boney. The skinny boy patted and stroked and spoke to the dogs very lovingly in quick French, which Susie pretended to understand, and Janet suddenly felt furious. Scamper! she shouted. Come away! You know you're not supposed to be friendly with strangers. You'll be stolen one of these days if you're so silly. Stolen? said the French boy, looking alarmed. Ah oui, there is a, what do you call it, a dog thief here in this town. Jacques, mon ami, he told me so. Mon ami means my friend, said Susie. Jack is his friend, you see. Susie, stop speaking to me as if I was in the first form, said Janet, her face red with rage. Scamper, will you come here? Scamper stopped fussing over Boney, and at once the other two dogs took his place, whining with pleasure as the boy patted them. Janet marched off, head in air, swinging her shopping basket. That awful Susie, showing off like that, and that grinning binky friend of hers. And what an extraordinary boy Boney was, so skinny, so short-sighted and owlish. And yet, how fond he must be of animals for dogs to go to him like that. It just showed how silly dogs could be. Any of those dogs, yes, even Scamper, would have followed him for miles. Janet soon finished her shopping, raced home, pinned on her badge, and then down the garden she raced and banged at the shed door. She could hear voices inside. Password! shouted Peter. Toad in the hole! shouted back Janet. The door opened, and Peter looked out crossly. Janet, haven't I told you before not to yell the password at the top of your voice? The six were now all ready for their meeting. Scamper, too. He sat solemnly beside Peter, looking as if he might join in the conversation at any minute. Now, this meeting has been called at Pam's request, he began. It's about this dog-stealing business. Woof, said Scamper. Pam, tell us about your granny's dog and all details about its being stolen, said Peter. Pam poured out the whole story and tears began to run down her cheeks. Don't let's get upset now, said Peter. What can we do, said George. I mean, if the police can't find the thief, what chance have we? We have solved other problems before, said Peter. And anyway, children sometimes hear things and spot things that grown-ups don't. And, but what do we know about the thief, said George? Nothing at all. How can we find a thief we don't know anything about? That's where you're wrong, said Peter. We know, for instance, that he has very big feet. So have plenty of other people, persisted George. My father, for instance. He wears size ten. Oh, do shut up, George, said Peter. You can make your comments later. Don't you understand that this is a very special meeting? It might even save old Scamper from being stolen. All right, Peter, said George, impressed. Go on. I won't interrupt again. I'll just briefly say what we know for certain about the thief, said Peter. It's what the police told my father. They said that, judging by the big, deep footprints left in the snow by the thief, very large prints, the man must be a tall, heavy fellow who knows a great deal about dogs, whether they're valuable or not, I mean. He's stealing only pedigree dogs, ones that are valuable and can be sold for a good price.
the dogs bark when they're stolen? asked Holly. It's likely that the thief throws down meat with some sort of sleep drug in it, said Peter. The dog eats it, falls asleep, and then the thief picks him up and goes off with him. Doesn't anybody think it's odd to see someone carrying a fast asleep dog? All right. You think of some way to entice a dog away without bribing him or drugging him, said Peter. Well, I do know a way, said Janet, making everyone sit up straight in astonishment. Believe it or not, this morning, when I was out shopping, Scamper suddenly went to a complete stranger and licked him and loved him and didn't want to come with me even when I ordered him to. I don't believe that, said Peter at once. Whatever do you mean, Janet? Just exactly what I say, said Janet, and straight away told the meeting what had happened. There was a silence. Everyone stared at Scamper in the greatest astonishment. He stared back, wagging his tail a little. Sounds a bit like the story of the Pied Piper of Hamlin, said Colin at last. You remember how every single boy and girl loved him and followed him? Well, this boy Boney sounds like a Pied Piper for dogs. I see what you're getting at, said Peter. You think these valuable dogs might not be drugged or enticed with food, but just follow a sort of Pied Piper fellow. Well, I just don't believe that. Scamper, for instance, might lick Boney all over if he met him, but he certainly wouldn't go away with him. I agree with you, said George, and knock, knock, knock. Someone was at the door. Peter at once thought it must be Susie and Binky. Keep out! This is a private meeting, he shouted fiercely. Well, is it too private for cups of cocoa and new-made buns, said a familiar voice. And Peter leapt up at once. Mother, just what we all felt like. Thanks most awfully. The six and Scamper set to work on the hot buns and the steaming cocoa. Peter passed round the sketches he had made of footprints behind old Matt's hut, and they were much admired. Well, to go on with our meeting, said Peter, I think we may safely rule out the idea that dogs are stolen by a kind of Pied Piper. So we come back to the idea that somebody is throwing down food that puts a dog to sleep when he eats it. I mean, it would be a very easy thing to do, wouldn't it? Well, it seems to me that the only thing we can do is to use the clues that the police told my father about and look out for anyone tall, heavily made, with enormous feet. Right. Then you want us to look out for someone like that and see if we can find out anything about him. If he goes out at night, for instance, said Colin. Yes, said Peter. But for goodness sake, don't let anyone know you're following them. Janet, I think Scamper wants to go out. He's scraping at the door. Stop it, Scamper. Janet, let him out. Had I better go out with him, said Janet. I mean, he might get stolen. Don't be an ass, said Peter. Stolen in daylight, in our own garden, with all of us here to hear him bark, impossible. Janet opened the door, and Scamper disappeared, barking in delight. The meeting went on until Peter declared the meeting closed. About twelve o'clock, he said, looking at his watch. Well, good luck, everyone, and be sure to report anything interesting. He and Janet walked back to the house. Peter carrying the empty cups. Where's Scamper? said Janet. Scamper! Scamper! Here, come along. No Scamper appeared, and something cold seemed suddenly to clutch at Janet's heart. She stood quite still and looked at Peter, fear on her face. Peter, she said. Why doesn't Scamper come? Who, oh, Peter? Ass? I suppose you think somebody came along and cleverly stole him while we sat in the shed, said Peter. Just like that without a bark or a whimper or a howl from old Scamper. Really, Janet, he's probably in the kitchen, begging for a new baked bun. Yes, yes, of course he is, said Janet. I'll go and see. But Scamper wasn't in the kitchen. He didn't appear at all, even when Peter yelled for him in his very loudest voice. Mother came to see what all the shouting was about. We can't find Scamper, said Janet desperately. Mother, have you seen him? I haven't seen him since I came to bring you buns and cocoa, said Mother. Don't look so upset, dear. He's sure to be about. He may have gone rabbiting. Not in the snow, Mother, said Janet. Mother, I have a dreadful feeling about him. He's stolen. I know he is. Oh, Mother. She flung herself on her mother and cried bitterly. Don't be silly, Janet, said her mother. He's probably gone to meet your father. But he hadn't. He seemed completely to have disappeared. Peter and Janet and their mother hunted everywhere and called and whistled. It was a very unhappy family that came to the dinner table at one o'clock. The children's father was back and hadn't seen a sign of Scamper. But he can't have been stolen, 
he said for the twentieth time. You'd have heard him bark if he'd been taken anywhere by anyone. Scamper would never, never go with a stranger without a great struggle. He'd bite him. Not if someone gave him drugged meat and he fell asleep after he'd eaten it, sobbed Janet. You know that's what probably happened to the other dogs. The police said so. Now, let's think, said her father. Who has been here this morning? What tradespeople have called? We'll ask Cookie. Cookie was startled and upset to hear that Scamper had disappeared. Well, let's see now who's been here in the last hour, she said. There was a grocer with his van, and Alfred and John Higgins, two little boys collecting for something, and the postman, and the laundryman, and his van, and old Mrs Hughes calling for the mending, and a man after a farm job. After a farm job? That sounds like someone who might steal Scamper, said Peter. Quick, Dad, ring up the police. We must get dear old Scamper back. We must, we must. Peter's father rang up the police at once and asked them to keep a lookout for Scamper. He can't have been gone for much more than an hour, he said. Stolen from your garden, you say, sir, said the policeman. Have you a list of people calling at your house during the time you mention? Yes. And there seems to have been quite a stream of callers, some with vans, said Peter's father. A van would have been very useful. If Scamper had been popped into one, the running of the engine would have drowned his barking. About this man who called for a job on the farm, sir, have you a description of him, asked the policeman. Yes. I saw him myself, a little fellow with a limp. Not strong enough for farm work. Well, that rather rules him out, sir, said the policeman. We think the thief is a big fellow, you know, with big feet to match. Yes, well, you're probably right, said Peter's father. I think the small boys who came collecting can be dismissed as suspects too, said the policeman. I'll see the laundry man and the grocer, said Peter's father. I don't for one moment think they're the thieves, though. We know them so well. That afternoon... Peter and his father went to the laundry and asked to see the van man who collected their dirty laundry that morning. He came out at once and nodded to Peter, who had often ridden in his van when he was smaller. I hear you want to see me, sir. Anything I can do? Um, did you happen to see our dog Scamper when you called this morning? Well, sir, no. Don't tell me he's been stolen. We're rather afraid he has, said Peter. What time did you come to the house? Let's see now. About quarter past eleven and I didn't see a sign of the dog. Quarter past eleven? Well, he was down in the shed with us then, said Peter. Sorry I can't help you more, young sir. The man clapped Peter sympathetically on the shoulder. Hope you find him. Peter and his father went off. Well, it can't have been the laundry man, said Peter. Let's go to the grocer's now, Dad. The grocer's man is a great big fellow. He's a new man too, Cookie says. He just might have taken Scamper. The grocer was very concerned to hear about Scamper. He called to the back of the shop. Reggie, come here a minute. You delivered goods at the farm today, didn't you? A big burly man came out, red-faced and smiling. Yes, sir, I did. Anything wrong? This boy's dog has gone and they're afraid he's been stolen. He'd like to know if you saw the dog anywhere around when you delivered the groceries. What sort of dog, sir? A golden spaniel, said Peter at once. No, sir, I didn't see any dog at the farm, said the man. Well, thanks, said Peter's father, and walked out of the shop. He might have taken Scamper, said Peter. He's the kind of man that would make heavy footprints in the snow, Dad. He's heavy and tall and has big feet. That's true, agreed his father, but he has such an open, honest face, Peter. And I took a look at the grocer's van, too. It was standing outside the shop. Did you notice? No, said Peter. Why? Was there anything peculiar about it? It was quite an ordinary van, said his father. But it only had a roof. It was open at both ends, so that goods could be easily put in and out, and... And that means that Scamper couldn't have been taken away in it. He'd have jumped out. Or at any rate, been seen, said Peter. We'll have to rule out the grocer's man. That leaves the boys who were collecting for something, the postman, and old Mrs Hughes, who comes for the mending, said his father. Well, I really think we can say the small boys had nothing to do with the matter. I don't see why, said Peter. Scamper likes children. He might quite well have gone off with them for a walk. Well, look, there's one of the boys, said his father. See, over there. And he has a dog with him, a terrier. Hey, Alfred, come here a minute. You question him, Peter. He might be scared of me. Alfred came over, rather shyly, his dog on a lead beside him, wagging its tail eagerly. Alfred, you came to the farm this morning, didn't you, with John, your brother, said Peter. Did you see our dog Scamper there? Yes, said the boy. He came up and wagged his tail at my dog Buster here. 
and they rub noses like anything. Scamper wanted to come with us. He seemed to like Buster. I hope your dog isn't lost. I hope not too, said Peter with a sigh. What time did you come to the house? About half past eleven, I think. Maybe a bit later, said Alfred. Thanks awfully, said Peter. Well, Dad, we can rule out anyone who came before a quarter to twelve, because Scamper was about then, when those boys came. It must be someone who came between then and the time we left the meeting. We'll go back and have some dinner, said his father. We can't do much more now. Nobody wanted much dinner that day. I can't seem to swallow properly, complained Janet. Well, we've seen one of the boys who came here this morning, and we've seen the grocer's man. He's not the thief, and we can rule out the laundry man because he came at quarter past eleven and didn't see Scamper. Did you let him out of the shed by any chance? said Mother. We did, said Janet. He scratched at the door, so out he went. That leaves a postman and old Mrs. Hughes who came to collect the mending, said Mother. Neither of them could have taken Scamper. Mrs. Hughes is absolutely terrified of dogs, and if the postman took away Scamper, everyone would have seen Scamper walking beside him, back to the post office. I do feel it must be someone like the man who came asking for farm work. Well, I saw that fellow myself, and he didn't in the least fit the description the police gave of the dog thief, said Dad. That only leaves Mrs. Hughes, said Peter. Well, you must know quite certainly that this poor old thing wouldn't steal a farthing, let alone a dog, said Mother. She loves Scamper and always brings him a titbit when she calls for the mending. A titbit, said Janet. Oh, Mother, do you think this morning's titbit had a sleeping pill in it? Do you think Scamper ate the titbit and fell asleep? And Mrs. Hughes, now do you imagine that poor little old lady could possibly carry a heavy dog like Scamper all the way from here to the village? said her mother. This is getting ridiculous. Let's have another meeting and talk about the whole thing, said Peter, seeing that Janet was near tears at being spoken to so sharply. We may think of something. I don't want a meeting without Scamper, said Janet, beginning to cry. I've a good mind to go all round the village and look for men with very large feet, said Peter, banging the table and making everyone jump. Oh, don't be silly, said his mother. You can't possibly go up to anyone with large feet and say, please, have you stolen my dog? Peter just couldn't help smiling at this, though the smile disappeared almost at once. All right, Mother, I think I'll call a meeting and see what the others have to say. It was a relief to have something to do. Peter went off to George's house. Dear old Scamper's been stolen, he told the startled George. I'm calling a meeting again at once. Will you go round and tell the others? Of course! said George, shocked. Cheer up, the secret six will get him back. Off he went, and soon he'd rounded up the rest of the club, Colin, Pam and Barbara. They were horrified at the news. There now, said Pam, I was afraid of Scamper being stolen as soon as I heard the news that my granny Snowy had gone. Let's get to the meeting shed, quick. On the way there, they met Susie, Binky, Boney and Jack. Ha! Huh, called Susie at once. Going to have a meeting of the secret six? Have you turned anyone else out yet? I'm expecting any minute to hear you're the secret too. Shut up, said Pam. We're going to have a most important meeting about Scamper. He's been stolen. Oh, I expect he's just run away, said Susie. I would too if I were Peter's dog. Susie, be quiet, said an angry voice. It was Jack's. He called to George. George, is that true? Has old Scamper really been stolen? Well, we're not absolutely sure said George, not certain if Peter would approve of him giving information to Jack, now that he wasn't a member. Anyway, it can't be of any interest to you now. The French boy hadn't understood properly. He turned to Jack. He says something of a dog. Uh, what a dog? Le petit chien s'en va, said Susie, fancying herself very much. Il est, um, stolen. Mais ça, c'est terrible, said Boney. Jack couldn't help nodding. Whatever would Janet and Peter do without him? Jack wished and wished he still belonged to the Secret Seven. How eagerly he would have helped to try and find dear old Scamper. Serves Peter right, said Susie, and was amazed to receive a really hard shove from Jack. He glared at his sister. If you say that again, I'll... I'll... I'll push you into the pond, he said. And dear me, he really meant it. Everyone arrived promptly for the meeting. They came to the shed and knocked. The password was said, and in they all went. Peter gave them a quick outline of the people who had come to the house that morning, both before and after Scamper had left the meeting. 
We ought to question every single one of them, said George. Well, most of them have been questioned, said Peter. Especially the two with vans. They could so easily have popped Scamper into a van, but we know they didn't. And the man who came after a job is in the clear, too. He was very small, my father said. And we do know that the dog thief has large feet and must be a big man. And it's not the two little boys, said Janet. Anyway, they came to collect for sick animals, so they'd hardly steal a dog. And it's not old Mrs Hughes. She's afraid of dogs, said Peter. Anyway, she's an old darling. And then there's Posty, the postman. You all know him. He's a tiny fellow, always bright and cheery. I should think his boots are no bigger than Janet's. Well, someone would have seen him with Scamper if he had taken him, said Colin. He has to go from house to house. Well, if that's all the people who came to the house, and not one of them took Scamper, he must be somewhere around, said Pam. Maybe he's hurt himself. Maybe he's lying about somewhere. Pam, can you imagine Scamper lying somewhere without giving a single bark or howl or whine, said Peter? Do be sensible. Now, has anyone any suggestions? Nobody had. Well, said Peter, looking from one to the other. Colin was the only one to answer. I'm going to do the only possible thing, he said. Something already suggested at our last meeting. I'm simply going to keep my eyes open for a heavy man with rather large feet and follow him home. If I get out scamper at the top of my voice, he's sure to bark, even if he can't come running out because of being tied up. It does seem to be about the only thing we can do, said George, frowning, though I've no doubt that the village will be crowded with big men and large feet. Well, I'm going to start this very afternoon. Shall we close this meeting, Peter, and get on with the job? It will be dark pretty early today. Right, said Peter. But for goodness sake, don't let anyone you're following guess that you're tracking them. Well, Peter, shall we go? When shall we report anything, if we have anything to report, said George. Oh, immediately, said Peter. Either Janet or I will be at the house. They trooped out of the shed, and Peter shut the door carefully and locked it putting the key under the stone as usual. He and Janet went back to the house. The other four walked down into the town together. They split up at the station and went their different ways. Colin said he was going to sit down on the seat outside the station and watch different people go by. I may see someone who's just the type we want, he said. Colin sat on the seat for a minute or two, watching the passers-by. And then he sat up straight. A man walked by with a heavy step. A man with outsized shoes, a burly man with a not very pleasant face. And he's carrying a dog, said Colin. I'll follow him. I'll follow him. The large-footed man walked heavily down the street, still carrying the dog. It wriggled a little, and the man put it down. It whined and dragged back, trying to get off the lead. Colin couldn't help feeling excited. The dog is trying to escape, he thought. And what a beauty it is. A tiny miniature poodle must be worth a lot of money. Has he stolen it? He kept as close to the man as he could. The fellow did not walk fast, but took such enormous strides that Colin had to hurry to keep behind him. The man came to the bus stop and sat down there, on the seat. Colin debated what to do. Perhaps he'd better sit down too. So down he sat. The little dog whined and strained towards the boy, and the man pulled him roughly back. Shame, called Colin dragging him away from me so unkindly. I'm sure he doesn't belong to the man. People aren't rough with their own little dogs. After about five minutes, the man got up and went on again. Colin leapt up too and followed. The man was now carrying the dog under his arm, and then suddenly, to Colin's great surprise, he tucked the little thing right inside his coat so that it couldn't be seen. Now why? thought the boy, puzzled. Gracious! There's a policeman coming along. This is very, very suspicious. hill, down the other side, and then round and back to the town again. At last, he came to the gate of a small house. He set the dog down, and it at once ran up to the front door. Colin stopped near the gate and watched. The man stood there at the gate, holding it open. He spoke to Colin. Do come in. 
You've been following me about for miles. Goodness knows why. Or are you practicing trailing for the scouts or something? Pray come in. I've had my eye on you all the way, young fellow, me lad. Though you thought I hadn't spotted you. You don't by any chance want to steal this little miniature poodle, do you? Colin simply didn't know what to say. He stood there, gaping. The man pushed him through the gate and up to the front door, holding him quite firmly by the arm. An old lady stood at the front door. She just opened it and at once saw the tiny poodle. She picked it up and fondled it. Didums enjoy his walky walk then, she said, and kissed the poodle on the top of his head. Who's this boy, John? I've no idea, said the man, and pushed Colin in front of him. He's followed me very carefully for miles. Maybe he wanted to steal Didums. Oh, the wicked boy! Surely he's not the dreadful dog thief, cried the old lady, and she hugged the tiny poodle to her. Let's call the police. Oh, no, please don't, said Colin. I'm not a dog thief, honestly I'm not. I, I thought perhaps you might be, sir. It, well, you see, well, it, it's not often you see a man carrying a tiny poodle. I mean, they're really lap dogs, dogs for women, aren't they? I... By this time, he'd been pushed into the house, and the front door was shut. Colin felt more and more alarmed. Please don't call the police, sir. Please let me go. You see, my friend has had his golden spaniel stolen, and we're trying to find it for him. We're all of us looking out for a large-footed man, and... And I have large feet, and was carrying a valuable dog. Well, you certainly puzzled me this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed your walk. May I go, please, sir? said Colin. I apologise. I do, really. No, I shan't let you go yet, said the man. Don't look so alarmed. I was just about to ask you to share a bottle of ginger beer with me, with a slice or two of lemon in it. Mother, will you get us some, and a few buns as well? Colin heaved an enormous sigh of relief. Now that he could look closely at him, he saw that he had a merry twinkle in his eye. Colin decided that he would be much more careful about trailing anyone in future. He enjoyed the ginger beer and buns, said thank you very politely, and escaped. Gosh, said Colin, scurrying home. I've done my bit today. I wonder how the others are getting on. Well, let's find out. Pam and Barbara are off on their own. What luck have they had? Pam and Barbara had decided to work together in their task of trying to find the dog thief. Two heads are better than one, said Pam, and off they went. They turned up a long, very quiet road. It ended in a lane that ran between fields. In a nearby field stood a large old rambling house with many sheds, big and little, round it. The girls walked on down the lane, and then Pam suddenly caught hold of Barbara's arm, making her jump. Barbara, can you hear that noise? What noise? Oh, that's only dogs barking, said Barbara. Only dogs barking? Aren't we looking for dogs? Well, do you see that lonely old house with all those sheds around, set in the fields? Wouldn't that be a marvellous place to keep stolen dogs, said Pam? Oh, Pam, no. Why should they be there, said Barbara? It's probably kennels kept by someone who takes care of people's dogs when they go away. Well, I'm going to look, said Pam. And what is more, I'm going to stand outside that high fence round the place and yell, Snowy, Scamper and Shadow. Oh, well, that's not a bad idea, said Barbara, feeling suddenly excited. The two girls went boldly up to the fence. Pam asked Barbara to hoist her up so that she could see over the top. Up she went and gazed on a mass of small and big sheds each with their own little yards. Dogs of all kinds and shapes were there, barking, whining, running about. Pam began to shout at the top of her voice, Scamper! Shadow! Snowy! Scamper! Scamper! The dogs heard the shouts and fell silent. Then they began to answer back. What a row they made! A young woman and a man came running out of the house to see what was the matter. They quietened the dogs in a trice and then saw Pam up on the fence. The man said something to a dog by his side and it raced out of the front gate and round the fence to the two girls, growling. Pam and Barbara were absolutely terrified. The man and the girl came up, looking very angry. What do you think you're doing, shouting at my dogs like that? He said. You be careful. They don't get loose and attack you. Please call off this fierce dog below us, said Pam, beginning to cry with fright. We, we were only calling out the names of some stolen dogs we know to see if any of them were here. You little idiot, said the man. We're dog breeders, not dog thieves. Now you go. Bob won't hurt you. He'll just see you off the field. Very timidly, 
the two girls jumped down from the fence and walked past the dog Bob and out of the field. They were most relieved to be safely back on the road again. I think that was rather silly of us, said Barbara. Let's go to the dairy and buy ice creams. They crossed the road to go to the dairy, and Pam suddenly nudged Barbara's arm. Look, there's Jack all by himself. Shall we speak to him? Jack had seen the two girls, but turned away. Pam called to him. Jack, come and have an ice cream. Jack shook his head. No, thanks. It's awfully kind of you, but... Well, I'm busy. We've been looking for the dog thief, said Barbara, but we've had no luck. Are you looking for him too, even though you're not in the club now? I might be, said Jack. Well, I can't stop now. As I said, I'm busy. Yes, Jack was busy. He had met Colin, who had told him everything he knew, all about the visitors to the farm that morning, the laundryman, Mrs Hughes, the two boys, the postman, the man asking for work, and the grocer's man. Jack had been thinking very hard. The dog certainly had been stolen. There was no doubt about that. But why hadn't he barked or howled when he was taken away? That was what puzzled Jack. The police thought the dogs didn't make a noise because they'd eaten some drugged meat. And then they had been carried away, thought Jack. But the thief must surely always have had a car or a van or lorry to pop the dog into. He sat on his bed and puzzled for a long time. Somehow, somewhere... There must be a clue that would fit this odd problem, some key to unlock the mystery. All the dogs must have known the thief, said Jack to himself. Scamper wouldn't dream of touching any food given to him by a stranger, and he definitely wouldn't go off with anyone he didn't know. So the thief must have been someone that all the dogs knew, someone that every one of them trusted and liked very much. It must be one of those seven people who went to the farm this morning. He decided to go out for a walk. I shall think better when I'm walking, thought Jack. Hello, there's old Mrs Hughes. She was one of the visitors at the farm this morning. Before he could go over and say hello, a small dog came bounding up to the old lady. She gave a horrified shriek and tried to beat it off with her stick. Jack went to the rescue at once. Well, he thought, as the dog ran off down the road. It certainly was not Mrs Hughes who took Scamper away. I'd better take the old lady home. She's really scared. It was on the way to Mrs Hugh's house that Jack saw Posty delivering letters. Oh, Postman, I've been so scared by a little black dog, said the old lady, and Posty nodded. Aye, ma'am, I know how scared you are of dogs. It's a good thing I'm not scared of them, for I meet so many when I'm out delivering letters. Ah, but they love you, don't they, Posty? said the old lady. How I'd wish you'd find that dog thief for us. I wish I could, madam, said Posty. He went through a nearby gate to deliver a letter, and at once a dog came bounding to welcome him. Well, little Tim the Terrier, how are you? said Posty, and patted the excited dog. Jack watched. If anyone could persuade a dog to go with him, the postman could. But he was not in the least like the thief. He should be tall, burly, and have large feet. And he should surely have a car or a van to take away a dog. Now, suppose Posty threw down a bit of drugged meat to that dog, and he ate it and fell asleep. Posty couldn't possibly carry him off over his shoulder without being seen. Jack trailed Posty, carefully keeping out of sight. Yes, every single dog belonging to any house the postman went to welcomed him with the utmost delight. He trailed the postman back to the post office, and was just about to go home when Posty came out again. He had no post bag this time, and he grinned at Jack. Hello, he said. I'm off home now. My poor feet are tired out. Jack didn't know where the postman lived, but he decided to see. He trailed Posty carefully, and saw him go into a small cottage not far away. A plump little woman was in the garden, taking in some washing. She was so like the postman that Jack guessed she was his sister. Hello, Tommy, she called. Your mule's in the kitchen. Help yourself. Are you going out again tonight? There's more snow forecast. Yes, Liz. I've got to go out, said Posty. Another delivery, you know. It'll be nice and dark then. Jack frowned. Nice and dark. Why nice and dark? Why should the postman be glad of the dark? Jack shook himself. Don't be silly, he thought. You can't suspect the postman. He loves dogs, and they love him. Next morning, everyone in the town was talking about the same thing. Another dog has been stolen. Have you heard? It's Mr. K's beautiful little prize pup. His Alsatian. Only four months old. 
and worth a large sum of money. It was Cookie at the farm who told Peter and Janet. Heard the latest news, she said. That dog thief has been at work again. Mr Kay's Alsatian pup has been stolen. Who told you, said Janet. Posty, said Cookie. He was that upset. Another lovely dog gone, he said. Jack too heard the news and frowned. Yet another dog? He knew Mr Kay and decided to go and see him. He arrived on Mr Kay's doorstep, just as he was saying goodbye to two policemen, who'd come to get particulars of the theft. Well, we'll do what we can, sir, said one of the men. I was very fond of him, said Mr Kay, and then he saw Jack. Heard about my poor pup? Yes, sir, said Jack. Is there anything I can do for you, sir? Well, that's nice of you, said Mr Kay. Come in. I'll tell you about Sasha. That's the pup. He wouldn't go anywhere with anyone except me. And he was getting a big dog, you know. When did he disappear? asked Jack. Last night, about half past six, said Mr Kay. It was pitch dark and had been snowing. I let Sasha out for a bit in the front garden. But when I called him, he didn't come. I hunted and hunted for him. And all I found was Sasha's paw marks and some very large footprints in the snow in my front garden. Anyone call on you yesterday evening? asked Jack. Not that I know of, said Mr K. Well, I do hope Sasha will turn up again, said Jack. Well, goodbye, and many thanks, said Mr K. Jack went down the drive to the front gate, frowning. Jack's thoughts came back to what he'd heard the postman say. It'll be nice and dark then. Nice and dark? Why did the postman and his sister think that darkness was desirable? Could he possibly be in league with the thieves? It obviously can't be the postman who is the thief, thought Jack. He's little, not big. His feet wouldn't make large prints in the snow. He adores dogs, and he couldn't possibly have taken away Scamper, because if he had, someone would have seen Scamper running beside him. All the same. I think I'll go to Posty's house this afternoon and have a little snoop round. He set off to the cottage about four o'clock that afternoon. Nobody was there. The front door and back door were both locked. It really would have been a good chance to poke round a bit. Not that I expect to find anything that will help, said Jack to himself. I'm probably on a real wild goose chase. I hope Posty or his sister don't come back and catch me. He tried the handle of the garden shed, but it was locked. He peered through the small, dirty window, switching on his torch. It was difficult to see anything clearly at first, but after a while his eyes grew used to the shadows inside the shed, and he could make out some flower pots, an old broom, and something else. Something rather surprising. Yes, very surprising. Jack suddenly heard a noise that made him rush to climb over the fence at the end of the garden and get away. A car had just driven up to the cottage gate. Jack heard the engine purr and then stop. It was a post office van that delivered parcels. Jack fled away over the field and disappeared. What a narrow escape. Jack raced home. If what he'd seen meant what he thought it did, the great dog mystery was solved. He raced up to the farm and hammered on the front door. Whatever's the matter, said Peter, opening the door. Peter, gasped Jack. I believe I know who the dog thief is. Where's your father? In the study, said Peter. Quick, this way. Soon Jack was standing in the study with a most surprised family listening to him. I think I know who stole Scamper, he said. In fact, I'm certain. Who, said the children's father. The postman. Old Posty, said Jack. There was an amazed silence, and then Peter spoke. Impossible, he said. The police say that the man had very large feet, and he probably had a van to take away the dogs. Well, I'll tell you what I saw in his shed a little while ago, said Jack. I saw a huge pair of boots, really enormous. They certainly weren't the right size for his small feet, so it's my guess that he wore them to steal dogs on a snowy night, leaving huge footprints behind to mislead everyone. I bet if you got hold of those boots and looked at the copies of the footprints that the police have, they'd match exactly. But, but what about Scamper, said Peter? We know he didn't go with Posty, or he'd have been seen walking down to the village with him. Did Posty bring any parcels for you yesterday, asked Jack, and saw Mother nod her head. Right. Then he must have used a parcels delivery van. This is all very serious, said the children's father. Are you quite sure that you saw those boots? My guess is that he threw down drug meat to dogs he wouldn't be able to persuade into the van, said Jack. Oh, quick! Let's do something, cried Janet. Let's make Posty tell us where he took the dogs. 
Can't we go and tell the police straight away, said Peter? They ought to go and make Posty own up and confess everything, oughtn't they? Yes, said his father. He turned to Jack and patted him on the back. You'll have to come with me, Jack. You've done well, very well. The police will want to know everything you can tell them. Mother, telephone the police and tell them we're coming and why. Jack went off with Peter's father. What an excitement! What an excitement! Peter and Janet and their mother could hardly wait for Dad and Jack to return. It seemed ages before the car could be heard purring up the drive. Janet heard a bark as it drew up and yelled in delight. Scamper! It's Scamper! And sure enough it was, dear, silky old Scamper, his ears flopping up and down as he rushed into the hall, his tail wagging nineteen to the dozen. He flung himself on the children, barking loudly in joy. And here's Shadow, yelled Peter. Dad, you've got him too. Is he all right? Perfectly, except that he moped for Matt, said his father. My word, I shall look forward to seeing old Matt's face tomorrow. No, Dad, let him go to Matt tonight, begged Janet. He'll rush up the hills and find Matt for himself. Matt won't want anyone there when he first sees Shadow again. You're right, Janet, darling, said her mother. Let him go to Matt, Dad. So the door was opened, and the collie shot out and disappeared into the darkness of the evening, barking wildly. What happened when you took the police to post his house? Peter asked Jack. Well, nothing very much, really, said Jack. Liz, Posty's sister, was simply terrified and blurted out everything. Posty wasn't there then. He came in later. But by that time, Liz had told us that when he went out into the snow at night, he did wear those enormous boots I saw, to make people think that the dog thief was a great big man. He stamped his feet hard into the ground to make deep prints, as if he were very heavy. Most of the dogs came to him willingly, according to Liz, said his father. Others he drugged, as we thought, by giving them meat with pills in. Where did he take them? asked Mother. To a friend of his, four miles away, who is a vet. And this fellow kept the dogs till all the excitement had died down, and then quietly sold them. Posty must have made a lot of money. Where is Posty now? asked Janet. In a prison cell, said her father, and he deserves to be well punished. Thank goodness that Posty's cousin treated the dogs well. Posty used the post office van to take Scamper and many other dogs away. Janet went to whisper in Peter's ear, and he nodded eagerly. He turned to Jack. Jack, will you do me a favour, please, he said. A very great favour. Of course, said Jack. Then please, will you allow me to pin this onto your coat, said Peter, and pulled out of his pocket the SS badge that Jack had refused to take back. Please, Jack, we've missed you so. We're all sorry now. We'll have a wonderful meeting tomorrow and tell everyone your great story. All right, said Jack, as Peter pinned the SS badge to his coat. I've missed you all too. Now we can be the secret seven again. Scamper will be at the meeting too, won't he? Woof, woof, said Scamper at once, wagging his tail. Shadow was on his way to Matt. He was bounding over the snow, up the hills to where the sheep were kept. If Matt had grieved for Shadow, the collie had certainly grieved for Matt. He'd eaten nothing since he'd been stolen and was as lean as a greyhound. Up he went and on and on to the top of the hill. He came to the hut and hurled himself against the door, panting loudly. Matt was startled. Who's that? he cried. And then he heard a whine, a whine that made him leap at once from his old wooden chair. Shadow scraped at the bottom of the door and began to bark. Matt's hands were shaking with joy as he unlocked the door. Shadow, old dog, you come back to me, said Matt. Shadow flung himself on the old shepherd, licking him, his tail waving and wagging without a stop. Matt sank down on his chair, and Shadow at once took up his old place, sitting close by the shepherd, his head on his knee, looking up at him with loving brown eyes. Matt put his wrinkled old hand on the dog's soft head. I've missed you, old friend. i missed you, he said. Goodbye, old Matt and Shadow. Goodbye, Scamper and the Secret Seven. It's good to know you're happy once again.